Okay, thank you all very much for coming. Thank you to Dan for the invitation. And yes, I, um, I'm going to talk to you about some of the work that I've been doing on uh, bab baboons and also vervet monkeys, both of which I study in South Africa. And I do so with um, a large number of collaborators whom I couldn't work without. For, uh, first and foremost is Peter Henze, um, who I've been collaborating with for the last 20 years. And we have a number of postdocs, PhD students, and other collaborators that we've all worked on this uh, project with. So thanks to all of them. Now, uh, I've been working on primates for one or another kind for most of my adult life. Um, I started with grey cheek mangabees in Uganda, and then I spent, uh, for my PhD, and I spent 12 years studying baboons in the Western Cape of uh, South Africa at the Dehwerp Nature Reserve, and uh, more recently we spent the last 10 years studying vervet monkeys in the uh, Great Karoo, um, in, also in South Africa, but now in the Eastern Cape. And I did a degree in ecology and I came to uh, primates that way and I did my PhD in an anthropology department and it was as a consequence of working with monkeys and, and, and doing field work in remote areas that I came to have a, a, it generated my interest in humans because when you're out in the field with monkeys what you suddenly realise is that they don't have days of the week and they don't have hours of the day and they don't have all of the um, scaffolds and artifacts that make human life possible and that we rely on so much for all of our activities. And so, there, so, there's a, so that's what got me interested in why it was that humans and other primates are so very different. And one of the things that, that is very different about humans is this, the very um, ingenious ways we can make use of artifacts in the world. And that's something that you see primates being uh, argued to have large brain sizes and to be very clever, but they don't seem to have this kind of thing. So why is that? And that's really the, the thing that drives a lot of my interest. And so as a consequence of working on both, and, I, and I've now been working on humans, and I've been doing some human behavior ecology in, um, on the Pacific island of Samoa, and also among um, uh, Inuit populations in the Canadian north, as well as um, large-scale data sets on you know, uh, people in Canada and the Netherlands. And one of the things that, I, that I've always been, um, that's always been with me since I first read it when I was a graduate student myself, is this, this quote by uh, Ashley Montague, where he argues that we have to be very careful on how we um, think about human nature, uh, because it's not just how, it's not, we mustn't base our ideas of ourselves on any false foundations, because it's the image of, hu of humanity that grows out of the, our understanding. How we think about ourselves kind of can make us into those kinds of people because of our, the, the kind of deep reflexivity that we have. And so that, that's something that um, I'm also concerned with as someone who spans human, non-human boundaries as, as to thinking of how is it that we're thinking of humans and how they relate to other primates and what image of humanity that gives us. And um, I think these kinds of things help illustrate that quite nicely. So what you've got here are two Australopithecines uh, walking along. And this is a reconstruction from the Laetoli footprints. So what we do know, and so these, there they are along the bottom there, and, these, and so what we do know is that there were two individuals walking side by side. One seems to be heavier than the other, the footprints are deeper, so either that individual um, was, was larger or perhaps it was carrying something. So those are the things we know from those footprints. We know obviously they were bipedal. But this, everything else here is a reconstruction. And as you can see, the male is, is a male and a female. The male is protectively has his arm around the female. All these kinds of things that seem very familiar to us, very human. But they also, you know, are, is that really how it was? Are we really um, simply projecting our own understanding of life back onto those creatures? Because we see images like this all the time. Even the British royal family are known to, like, you know, march around like in, in this kind of a way. So that's always been something that sort of tempers how we have to think about these things and, and the care we have to take. And then the other thing that everyone always says about watching uh, when you watch primates is, um, you know, oh, it's very much like it's like a soap opera. You know, when you go out every day and you see these individuals, you see these animals, it's like watching a soap opera. And I've always thought that was a bit of a, a thing to be careful of as well because, you know, soap operas, you know, they aren't like real life. That's why we all watch them. If, if soap operas were like real life, we wouldn't really watch them, would we? <laughs> They'd be very boring. There'd be no nice storylines. Things wouldn't get tied up. Life's just not like that. And, and I think, um, again, this is a trope that people 
talk about all the time. They say, you know, um, Shirley Strum in her book Almost Human, which is one of the first books I read when I um, just, you know, realized that I wanted to study primates. This book was uh, Almost Human was one of the big seminal works for me. And she talks about the, the early morning soap opera of, of baboon life. Um, Karen Stry here talks about her work on the Murakis, that it's like, you know, the Murakis life is like following a soap opera. And as uh, more, most recently here, we've got uh, Robin Dunbar and his colleagues saying, you know, as every field primatologist will tell you, is the soap opera of daily life in a monkey group that, can, that creates its fascination and its intricacy. And I think what people are getting at here is really the fact that we see primate lives as very individual. And that's what Karen Stry is clearly saying there in the middle. It's, it's they're different from, seeing, um, from, from thinking of anonymous kinds of groups. It's the individuality of each individual that, that helps generate this. And as Pamela Asquith says, you know, the soap opera quality of the daily displays of primate life, they, they perhaps come about more because they're, we more readily recognize ourselves in our primate cousins. And obviously we will because they are our primate cousins. That's obviously going to take uh, place. But does that mean we're really seeing what's there or are we projecting? So there's always these these tensions in how we how we study primates other than ourselves and what that means for when we study our own species. And I think these ideas of to do with um, thinking of life as a soap opera, thinking of these very highly individualized lives in all these kinds of ways, has sort of they feed they they kind of fed into and helped generate and continue to feed into um, the social brain hypothesis, which is one of the, the main um, hypotheses uh, to account for both the large brain size and uh, large group size of the primates, that somehow complex sociality and large brain size complex and the inference of complex cognition go together in some or other way. So, Various people have come up with this independently. And the idea of all, the, all the, it's like the social intelligence hypothesis, the Machiavellian intelligence hypothesis, it's now called the social brain hypothesis. But what they're really getting at, you know, all these different variants, is that the ecological demands of, that primates face are really not that much more demanding than any other creature who isn't so well endowed with neural tissue. So what is it about primate life that makes it so difficult to deal with? And the argument is, well, it's social life. It's, it's having to do with other animals that have an agenda that makes life more complicated. And um, so, and uh, you know, there's a lot going for it. There's empirical evidence to support it. More, there are some recent empirical papers that kind of question it and suggest the importance of ecological factors may need to be reconsidered by um, Alistair Cassian and Lauren Powell. Um, Alistair Cassian's at New, at New York University and uh, Lauren Powell's at the University uh, of Durham in the UK. And they suggest that we need to rethink these ecological hypotheses. But th there's something, you know, there clearly is something about primate social life that we need, that, that is interesting and we need to understand. But I also have this worry that goes on with my soap opera worry and my image of humanity worry, is that the, so the social brain hypothesis seems to have a little bit of circularity in it. So the idea is that complex group structures selected for increased brain size in order to be able to deal with that complexity. But the thing that makes life complex is your ability to perceive its complexity. So it's what you as an animal bring to the party. This is why a primate group is more complex than a group of impala on the plains, because the primates see more complexity uh, there. And as a consequence of having that ability to perceive what's going on between other animals, to understand their machinations and all the shenanigans that they're up to, that then selects for larger brain size. And this is, you know, I'm not, I didn't notice, you know, I wasn't the first person to, to notice this circularity. And Gerd Gigerenza did it, you know, not that long after the Machiavellian intelligence and social brain hypotheses came out. And he actually wrote about it in the second volume um, of, uh, that was dedicated to discussing the Machiavellian intelligence hypothesis. So he said, you can't use the degree of uh, perceived complexity in a primate group. You can't use that to explain why a particular level of social intelligence evolves in a species because that perceived complexity itself is dependent on or is in fact a part of social intelligence. So there's this kind of circularity inherent in the, in the social brain hypothesis that's not been quite worked out fully yet. But, um, and then finally, so I'm just kind of telling you almost the things, all my angst and worries here and, 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 the, the, and what we need to think about and the things I don't think we fully captured yet. So, you know, this is the sort of idea that we're, that we're dealing with the, the primate uh, social brain hypothesis, is that 
because you're forced to live in groups to avoid predation, that requires you to take certain kinds of tactical action to deal with the fact that you're dealing with other agents who have their own agendas that don't necessarily line up with yours. And one way of, of um, achieving your own goals when others need to achieve theirs is to form alliances with other individuals um, that you can, these coalitions and alliances that you can service through grooming, that you protect and, and you value these re uh, relationships and therefore you reconcile them when they become damaged. And these things are argued to generate certain cognitive demands in terms of things like the ability to reason analogically, to understand that your relationship to, to another individual is equivalent to the relationship between two other individuals, that you um, have a certain level of conceptual knowledge, you understand things like kinship and rank conceptually, and that you can also sort of um, have a perspective cognition. You under there's some suggestion inherent in these arguments that you understand that your relationships are valuable and that they have to be protected and repaired, and that's why you prepare, you, you um, uh, keep them in good condition because you know that you might need them later. So there's a sort of, it's all, lots of these things are kind of implicit in the ideas relating to these things. But these are the kinds of cognitive demands that um, primate groups are argued to face, and that's what selects for large brain size. But I think a lot of these things here are, they're kind of, they come about through sort of a, a, a logical argument um, rather than a great deal of empirical evidence. And in fact, we're sort of working backwards because what we know we have are large brains and we know we have groups. And so it's in a sense, we've kind of worked backwards from front the kinds of things that large brains let you do in order to generate these ideas about the cognitive demands of, of living in uh, social groups for primates. And I think this, this then touches on the other, the final thing is that these tend to be quite anthropocentric and there's nothing wrong with an anthropocentric question. There's nothing wrong with asking, well, we can do these kinds of things, can other species do them as well? There's nothing wrong with trying to understand that, but I think it does then infect how we view other animals and is that always the most accurate way to do it? So these ideas about these kinds of cognitive demands have been generated because they're feeding into these ideas about the things that we have, that we consider to be unique to our species, that are the key to, understand, to, to understanding human success. Obviously, one of them is language that obviously always gets raised, but also these ideas of theory of mind, the ability to represent and uh, understand other individuals' mental states. And um, I think this, this final one is this, this kind of anthropocentric view is one that is the most prevalent and I think the most pernicious because now the social brain hypothesis is being applied to species beyond the primates, it's being applied to, to birds where pair bonding seems to be the, the thing that um, explains much more variance in brain size than living in large uh, group sizes. But, but still this idea that, that what we, what's required to, to deal, what the, the cognitive demand of dealing with other individuals is, lies in something to do with the ability to take another's perspective, to, ha to have an understanding of mental states. So um, Robin Dunwell, for example, in writing about what's demanding about pair bonding, said the following, that you are attentive to your mate's needs because understanding whether or not your mate can achieve their daily nutrient intake has many of the hallmarks that we would be recognised uh, that we would recognise as theory of mind in humans. Okay, so pair bonded species have to be able to engage in perspective taking. Right, that's an assertion. There's not an argument there really. There's no evidence there. But they have to be able to do this if the social brain hypothesis is to cohere as an uh, integrative theory of social brain or of, of uh, brain size evolution across a variety of mammals and birds. So, and I think this is the, 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 there is a Wittgensteinian scholar in philosophy called uh, Ian Ground, and he calls this tendency logomorphism. And that's the, he argues that that's the fallacy of um, linguistic, uh, a linguistic species always trying to understand other species in similarly linguistic terms. And the way the, the current theory of mind uh, uh, work is, is sort of presented and articulated, all these ideas about theory, theory in particular, is that it's a highly linguistic construction and we apply that to non-linguistic animals and assume that those kinds of uh, uh, modes of representational thought apply just as well to those species as they do to us. And I'm personally not sure that that's a valid inference. And, um, and, and it came about through reading lots about other 
kinds of animals besides primates, besides ourselves. And in this book, I tried to sort of articulate that. There's nothing really about primates in here at all, but it was, it was a way of saying, well, what's an, uh, an alternative view that we can generate, where we don't simply assume that all the interesting stuff is going on purely in the brain, and that it has to take these kinds of very representational forms that we use when we study human cognitive psychology. Is an alternative, and I think there is. And one of the, the um, <clears throat> areas of, of philosophical thought that I found most interesting is this idea of, of inactivism. And what um, inactivists say is that we don't need to, you can, we can dispense with what they call mental gymnastics, this idea that thought involves the manipulation and um, transformation of internal symbols of some or other kind. And that in terms of understanding non-human animals, I think this has a lot of promise. And their argument, like, you know, that some of the, the strongest inactivists say, well, we can also understand a lot of human behavior in similar terms. And the, the linguistic, socio-cultural practices that we engage in, they come in late, they are unique to us, they color everything we do now, but, we're, but a lot of what we do is still, can still be understood through thinking non-representationally and thinking inactively. So if you wanted to know more about that, please feel free to ask, but that's as much as I'm going to say for now. And um, there are some arguments to say that the original inactivist was, in, was in fact Ludwig uh, uh, Wittgenstein um, because he was the person who, who really kind of best articulated the ways in which we're kind of, we're sort of mistaken, we're bewitched by language when we try to understand what the mind is and how to think about the mind. And so a lot of people who have uh, taken his, his lead and have been writing about how we can understand non-human animals in these more inactivist and Wittgensteinian terms. And one interesting thing I came across was this um, article uh, by uh, this guy, Segedal. And what's interesting about this, it's about Kanzi, who's the bonobo who is able to use um, lexigrams to, to uh, use language and, and, our, and communicate with humans in a particular way. And he's writing about how we, you know, we need to understand Kanzi differently because we're always trying to understand him in how he's achieving these things in very human terms. So we need to understand how he's achieving these symbolic um, abilities on his own terms. And he makes a very interesting argument. But what he says here is one of the big mistakes we make is to think that the opposite of what it means of being human is to be animal. But humans are animals. So that cannot be the, the opposite because we are always and already animals as well as humans. So you can't, you can't juxtapose them. That's, that's an incoherent position. What's um, the opposite of, of, hum of, of human, he suggests, is this idea where we over-intellectualize our own capacities, where we take the idea that, that what it means to be human is this idea to have this kind of very um, rarefied forms of, of representational thought and assume that those things are the things that, that matter and we should look for in other species. And, he, and, and Segedal calls those things inhuman. You know, there's really no, there's really no life in those um, articulations. And Daniel Moyal Sharak, who's another um, Wittgensteinian scholar who's interested in non-human animals, she's also said that, you know, when we try to re reawaken the animal in us, when we try to blur the boundaries between us and other species, we, we should be aware of, of over-intellectualizing that, of overly humanizing the non-human animal and, and then giving them, giving them the kinds of thought that we have on no other basis than that's the only thought that we can conceive of. And uh, finally, there's a developmental psychologist at the University of Portsmouth, Vasu Reddy, who does really lovely work on, on mostly on infants. And she says, you know, that what we do in a lot with these, uh, a lot of theory of mind style tasks that we, experimental tasks that we give to children in developmental psychology is we get rid of all the mess of social life and we make these things very clean and pure and well controlled because that's what it means to do an experiment. And she says it's really the mess of social life that is needed to produce social intelligence and that the gooey stuff, the messy stuff of life. And that's what we need that, to study if we're really going to understand social intelligence. So, so she says we need as Wittgenstein put it, to get back to the rough ground. We need to look at social life in all its messiness and stop trying to, to overly generalise and purify and kind of um, essentialise and look at the mess of, of life itself. And I think that's, uh, um, these, these arguments have, uh, speak to me very powerfully and I'm very interested in them. And so we need to, you know, we need to get back to this messy stuff. And 
I still haven't managed to do this yet. I was thinking that there must be a way to tie this, the, what I've been talking about now to the, to the next part of my talk, which is really the empirical work that we've been doing on, on primates. And I, I, can't, I haven't really got there yet, but really I think what I'm trying to say is that um, the understanding of, of what primate complexity is is based on this very human idea, and it suits us because it allows us to make a, uh, a nice, seamless argument where we can go from, from the non-human primates and other animals to us and that's what evolutionary continuity demands. But evolution is also a diversity generating process. It's not just about continuity and we should give that some serious consideration as well. And I think that's what, what I'm, I'm trying to get at here is that the other thing we do when we look at primates is we think of them as plastic and we assume that that plasticity is a feature of every single individual. And we don't think of individual variability in plasticity itself and plasticity as a trait that can be acted on by selection. So if we're going to really understand something about primates on their own terms, we need to find a way to study social life and behavioral flexibility in a way that doesn't necessarily always begin and oops, what's happened there? Begin and end uh, with humans as its kind of anchor. So we worked on um, Baboons in uh, the Western Cape in, in South Africa, as I said, for about 12 years. And we um, were interested in some of the, the ideas of people like uh, Susan Perry and, and Joe Manson, I can see him over there, and uh, Joan Silk, about you know, what is the adaptive value of sociality? Um, does, it, does, it, does it serve an adaptive value? This is what another thing that the social brain hypothesis demands of us. And so we need to show that social life is um, adaptive. And one of the things that um, Joan Silk and uh, her collaborators um, from the Ambazelli Baboon Project, Jean Altman and Susan um, Albert showed, was that you could look and show that there were these advantages to animals who had strong and resilient and enduring bonds. So you get this kind of, they developed this composite sociality index, um, which is you combine various kinds of affiliative behavior, often grooming and proximity are the, are the most obvious ones because they're the ones that occur most frequently. And then you can um, count up the number of dyads uh, and, uh, who have a sociality index of a certain value and you get this kind of distribution. And this is, this is very similar to, the, this is from our study, but it's very different, dis, uh, similar to the distributions you get from the Ambazelli baboons, from the baboons that uh, Dorothy Cheney and Robert Safar study in, in the Okavango Delta. So you get um, a lot of dyads who have uh, a, uh, a large, you know, small, let's start this, a large, a small number of animals have a few very strong bonds and a large number of animals have very few strong bonds. So you have um, animals who invest effort and time into a small number of individuals, often their kin, and um, you get this like long tail of it where you get uh, very few animals who have high numbers of those strong bonds and you're getting a lot of weak bonds. So we were interested in saying, well, you know, if having lots of strong bonds is so good for your um, fitness, so it improves infant longevity, it increases your own longevity, it, it um, increases your birth rate. If all these things are very important, if they have these fitness effects, why, why even bother having any weak bonds at all? Surely the effort you put into maintaining a certain number of weak bonds should be effort you could put into strong bonds because that would surely then boost your fitness even more. So is there any point to having weak bonds? And what was interesting when we started looking at these things ourselves is that we realised that don't, nobody had actually looked at the potential adaptive value of, the, of maintaining a lot of weak bonds. They'd focus solely on what do strong bonds do. And in our study, we looked at... Uh, at weak bonds as well and um, we found that strong bonds predicted aspects of birth rate and interbirth interval but in our population it was the more weak bonds an individual possessed the longer their infants survived so having maintaining a lot of weak ties which we think reflects just being very well integrated into the social network uh, had this advantageous fitness outcome and the, the real point I want to make here is that when you look at the patterns of these strong versus weak bonds over, so this is all sort of collapsed down and giving, to give you a, an overall 
average picture, so to speak. If you look at the actual picture through time, what you can see is that for both strong bonds and weak bonds, what you get is basically a mess. There's a lot of variability here. The females, females vary in the number of strong bonds they maintain within and across years. They vary in the number of weak bonds, and there's no real relationship between those two. So it's like this, is like, this is interesting. There's something going on here, and we're not entirely sure what it is. But you know, collapsing it all down and getting these, these averages isn't really pulling out what this variability is, is, is doing and what it's for. And what we're working on now is to try and use social network analysis, which gives you a sort of um, more precise measurements of how animals are connected up to each other, to use that to get at what's going on here. What, when you get variability itself, does variability itself have some relation to <laughs> fitness outcomes, to survivorship and uh, infant uh, longevity? So we're needing to, to come up with a way to produce dynamic networks. And that's, you know, is always a problem with how you deal with time. So what you've, you know, when we looked at the, the kinds of things of so far, we've just taken an average, a single point averaged over a large uh, time period, which doesn't really, you know, there's a lot of information that you're losing there. You could average over um, years or months or, you know, whatever you choose, but you're still losing a lot of information. So what we've been trying to develop is what we've called a, a moving window, which is just like a sort of moving average. So we take, you, can take, you can make your window any size you wish, um, from you know, uh, a day up to a year, up to five years. And then what you do is you just, um, you can see this is the, the, the window here, it's 30 days here. You just, as the window moves along, you take you, you, the, the, the day here drops out and another day is added in. So you get a kind of moving average network. So then you can look at the actual patterns of, the, of network dynamics through time. And we're, we're hoping this will um, provide us with a better way of getting a handle on these things. So when you calculate a, a, a dynamic network um, using this moving window approach, you can get a measurement for the group as a whole and how certain network measures uh, vary through time. So this measure here, I'm just using average strength. Uh, which is the amount of effort an individual puts into uh, other individuals. So you can get a level of the, the group level um, variation in strength over time. You can get individual level variation in strength. And you can also do it for dyads, particular pairs of individuals. And so when you, what, what you're seeing here is, again, I point to you, is how much variability there is across individuals here. And what, what is that? Is it just noise or is it information? Those are the... the things that we want to, to get at. So this shows you um, the same data from the baboons on the, at um, this moving window dynamic network at the individual level. It's a measure of network strength for an ego uh, network. And this is NDVI. So I have completely always forget what NDVI stands for, but the last two things are vegetation index. But it's an index of how green the environment is, how much photosynthesis is taking place in the environment and therefore it's a measure of productivity and you can get it by a remote sensing. So with the rise of Google Earth and all these great, great uh, satellite, all the great satellite imagery you get now, you're, you're able to do your, a lot of the ecological monitoring we do now is remotely sensed rather than, rather than done on the ground and we are currently sort of ground treating that to make sure that the, what we find on the ground reflects the, the NDVIs we get from the remote sensing. But here you can see that, that there's some sort of relationship here with um, the responses to the changes in, in greenness, changes in productivity, that network measures are sensitive to that. But for some individuals, some individuals are very sensitive and some are hardly sensitive at all. And that again is like, why is that? What's going on there? Just understanding something about, and this is what this seemed to me like what we really need to get at when we're talking about things like plasticity and flexibility and what do those differences mean and, 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 um, for the animals. So the other thing we've been developing is, is how to look at these things using the concept of behavioural reaction norms, which is something that comes from the animal personality literature and has been developed by, particularly by this, um, by Niels Dingermanser and his colleagues. Um, and what their argument is, is that, you know, personality is an interesting thing because personality defined as consistent in individual differences among the um, individuals in a population it's kind of like the antithesis of what you, of you expect from plasticity because if you have personalities, if you have consistent behavioural traits that don't vary over context, it means that you haven't like, it means that certain individuals aren't as plastic as they could be. 
because they don't vary their behaviour by condition. And therefore, some members of the population are not expressing the full range of behaviours that they could. So they find that they were, they were um, interested in this because they were like, how would that evolve and how would it be stable? And then they came up with the notion, well, plasticity and personality do not have to be antithetical to each other. They could be combined really quite effectively using the idea of reaction norms taken from life history theory. So they came up with um, this idea. So if you take, uh, you plot, these are just notional graphs that they use to illustrate their point. So this is like what they, uh, mean-centered environmental gradient. So you take a kind of variation in rainfall or food or the number of animals in your group or the number of eggs in your clutch, um, anything you like, any kind of thing where you can generate a gradient. And here you have the phenotype. So what you've got, you can have, what you've got here is um, variation in slope, and with a, no variation in slope and only a single intercept. So you've got one kind of behavior type. The personality component um, is uh, the intercept, generated by the intercept. And then the plasticity is how the slope varies with changes over an environmental gradient. So in this case, you have four different personality types, but no plasticity whatsoever. There's no variation in slope but they hit the intercept at different points, they show into individual differences in behavior. You can get um, uh, slope, uh, uh, you, can get different, you can get equivalent differences in slope with personality traits. So each individual here has a different personality, but their response to plasticity, their response to the gradient is equivalent. So you have very little plasticity. Here you've got plasticity, personality, covariance. There's a variation in slope and uh, intercept, i.e. individuals vary in both their personality and the level of plasticity they show. And you can also get no relationship between those two. So you can measure the inter-individual differences um, across your individuals in your population and to, to just determine if they show uh, variation that is consistent. And you can also look at how that variation responds to an environmental gradient. So that's what we've been working on and developing now. We're sort of developing the ideas on the baboon data and coming up with ways in which the, the mechanisms and hypotheses we can test and then applying them to the, to the vervet data so that we're not sort of testing hypotheses on the same data that we use to generate them. So this is just to, what I'm going to show you now is really just illustrative. So this is the mean rate of spatial proximity to other individuals. And all the animals here in our baboon, uh, in the baboon groups that we had data for, sufficient data for, are along here. Males and females are mixed together here because we were really just trying to maximize the number of individuals we have. And these are ordered here by intercept. Okay, So the, this graph shows you animals ordered by the value of the intercept. So what you can see is there's variation in personality, that individuals have different intercepts. And what this one shows you is how much individual um, measures of spatial proximity, how close they remain to other animals, how that varies according to incoming solar radiation. So um, average temperature and how hot it was and how uh, it also uh, accounts for things like the amount of shade potentially available in the environment. So these animals, they, the same animals, and now they're arranged by um, slope. They're ordered by slope. So this is the values of the slope. And as you can see, there are certain individuals who respond more than others. And they also respond, dif you know, you've got this differential response here. So these individuals, you can say, are displaying plasticity as well as variation in personality. So it gives you a means of, of, of tapping into these things. And then you can plot a behavioral reaction norm. So what you've got here is solar radiation here, their proximity behavior here. And this gray area are animals who aren't really doing anything very much out of the ordinary. But these animals are the ones you saw at the top and bottom of the plasticity slope. So you've got some individuals who are showing this positive relationship, some individuals showing this negative relationship. So it's a way of tapping into how much variation you have. And then that gives you something to then start probing and asking, well, what is the value and benefit of, having, of being variable in this way? Is it just noise? Are these animals maladaptive, behaving maladaptively in some way? Or is this beneficial? Is this the kind of plasticity that individuals vary in? Is this driving, you know, is this kind of material for the, for the engine of selection? And then a final thing you can do is you can actually then also plot um, 
you know, so you know a regression recreation, you have um, an intercept and a slope, and you also, oops, this is me keep treading on this thing. There we go. You can have, um, you have intercept and slope, and you also have residual, you also have error. And Dave Westney, who works on birds, has suggested that maybe that error is not simply um, error, it's not simply noise. There may be biological information in that so-called noise, because what you're getting there is a measure of how unpredictable animals are. Not simply how plastic they are, but how, um, how their behavior varies in ways that, you, that, we, that we cannot yet explain. And they give the example of that, you know, if you, there's a paper, um, Judy Stamps has also done work on this, you poke a, a, a hermit crab with a, with a paintbrush, and you'd see how long it takes to emerge from its shell. And then you poke it again, and you see how long it takes. And then the variation in how long it takes to, you know, you give it the same, exactly the same test over and over again, and you see how variable its response is. Is that just error in the, when you get variation in how long it takes to emerge again? Or is that something that you could argue is potentially adaptive? That being unpredictable may make it harder for predators to, to, to catch you. Being, so it's about literally being unpredictable. And this is the thing here. So you can see that you're also getting variation in the predictability of these animals as well. And is that something that is just noise or is it worth probing to see if there's information, useful information that will tell us something about evolutionary processes in there? So the other thing is um, to note is that not, you, know, you can do re reaction norms, these behavioral reaction norms for anything. And you don't, you know, you'll see variation in the response of different reaction norms. So this is showing you, these are again the slopes, the animals are ordered by slopes, and this is reactivity to rainfall, and this is what you've seen before, reactivity to solar radiation. So what you can see here is that animals are responding, they're showing, they're showing a variation in response, but there's not much in terms of, they're not showing that much variation across individuals in terms of their plasticity. So there's variation across different contexts as well in the level of plasticity that individuals will show. And finally, you can also do this where you can. Um, this is reactivity to eigenvector centrality. So now we get back to our network measure. So again, we've ordered by slopes. And what the animals, you've got their reactivity. So this is their, how does their, um, how does their uh, spatial proximity behavior, how does their tendency to stay close to particular others, how does that itself vary in relation to changes in network structure? <coughs> and again, you can see that you get a bit of plasticity in this as well. So you can start looking at the things we're really interested in in terms of not just the ecological variables, but social variables as well. So like I said, we've been trying all, and playing around with our vervet data to look at these kinds of things. But for us, you know, really getting in and testing these ideas will involve um, female vervets, because those are the animals that we now have information for. And one of the things we've been developing is to look at um, particip uh, participation in intergroup encounters. Vervets are territorial. They um, have these you know, like big shenanigans, big barnies at the um, territorial boundaries. And females are very active participants in, in these things. And some males to some extent, but usually the females are much more active. And so we thought, well, this is a good way to develop um, uh, the idea of a reaction norm. Um, by looking in the vervets to see if you could identify and articulate the behavioral reaction norm for an intergroup encounter. So I'm just going to show you an intergroup encounter here. So these are members of one troop, these are members of a opposing troop. And so they, they um, I mean, we have three groups in quite close proximity, their territory, and they, they can do this up to 10 or 20 times a day on given some uh, periods of, of the year. So we've done and tried to construct a reaction norm for this. So this is the probability of individual participation in a, um, in a, a given intergroup encounter. We have 
data across three troops that vary in size from about 50 to 20. The largest group can get up to as much as be as large as 70 animals at times. The smallest we've ever gone is about 20. So we get variation in group size over time. And we've looked at these. These are um, uh, intergroup encounters over the previous three years. Um, that's what we've looked at to begin with. And that gives us a sample size of about 1,975 intergroup encounters. So we've got everyone um, ordered by identity along the y-axis and this is their probability of individual participation and these are the intercepts so yes you can see there's a kind of um, participation personality certain individuals are more likely to participate than others and we can also show that there is reactivity in the um, to so the so plasticity the when you vary the environmental gradient when you vary the number of opponent participants in the other group the number of individuals that they are actually fighting against you can also show that there's some degree of plasticity in this behavior. Not a great deal, but there's some variation there. So some individuals respond differentially to the number of other um, alternative opponents. And the same is true for reactivity. So depending on the amount of aggression the other group shows the group, the, the individual who's participating, they can also, uh, certain individuals are more likely to shift their behavior than others. So there's both personality and some degree of plasticity in individual participation rates. And we also looked at, oh, I should say, I'm just going to go back. So this is, this, what we've done here is calculate a mean plasticity, okay, for all individuals. So this is the center of the, um, grade, of the gradient, so to speak. And what you can see here is everybody responds positively to the number of um, opponent participants. So, the, so, the, so there's mean plasticity in the population as a whole, as the number of participants increase, m the individuals are, are um, more likely to participate, but there's, but there's some plasticity and some individuals are much, much more likely to participate than others. So again, you can show, there's, when, whereas in terms of um, reactivity to, to aggression, there's much less in the way of reactivity. Not everyone is shifting over in this quite the same way. There's a more muted response to the number, to the amount of aggression they received, and there's hardly any response to variation in food availability. So the, the plasticity that an individual shows, they're not reacting, their probability of participation, how they um, ramp up their participation or lower their participation depending on um, variation in the environment is not, an e is not due to ecological variation. It's clearly driven by social factors. So we think this is a really nice way to start delving into ideas about plasticity and um, uh, flexibility and getting a handle on what it means to be a plastic organism. And is this variation uh, uh, something that we can understand by looking at and relating it to, through time, fitness outcomes, you know, survivorship of of fitness-related outcomes, survivorship of infants, number of infants born, male mating success, male paternity, all these things are now waiting for us to do as we develop reaction norms for each of the behaviours that we, we feel are relevant, important, and, and likely to have this kind of effect. And then the, the, other, the other question we're um, answering really is, where does this plasticity come from? Why is it that certain individuals are more reactive than others? And obviously one of the origins of plasticity is likely to be early development and again variation in uh, conditions during development. So we've begun a cohort study of infants where we look at their um, growth rates, mortality, morbidity, how their age at sexual maturity and we'll look, then we'll follow them through to, to look at their own reproductive success. So the first cohort was born in 2013. The first female had her first baby um, this year. So we're already entering that phase of, of looking at the uh, reproductive success of our cro first crop of infants. And the second ones are just coming up to it. So we weigh the infants uh, on, a, on a scale. We put we on a large, it's a scale with a large board attached to it. We put baby toys on it. They all pile on there. You have to do a lot of uh, waiting around and a lot of hanging about till you can get individual weights because you have to wait till each of them jumps off in turn and then do a lot of uh, you know addition and subtraction and this is what they this is what they look like when they're um, approaching the whoops 
approaching the scale. And what's interesting, we also see variation in the individual's propensity and boldness to, to jump on the scale itself. So that itself can be a measure of, of, of you know, a plastic measure for us. So there is, they jump on the scale, they sit on it. You have to wait around till their tails get on it as well. That's annoying. Um, <laughs> but we get these pretty good measurements. And so what we've done with um, Chris Schmidt, who has data from the captive colony at Wake Forest, is we've been able to look at variation in growth rates um, over time between captive and wild populations and between our different cohorts of wild animals. So this is the predicted adult mass presented along the x-axis and what you've got here is maximum growth rate per day. So this is, this is sort of the inverse of um, the growth constant, K. And um, the reason we've just shown here is all, we want, all I want you to take away here is that these, this is um, captive animals on a standard diet, these are captive animals on, a, on an experimental high protein, low carbohydrate diet. These here, this is where our um, cohorts born in the year 2013 and the animals born in the year 2014. So you can see that the wild animals are both smaller, they're, they're predicted to be smaller as adults than the captive animals, which is what you'd expect. But the interesting thing is how much more variation there is in the wild population than the captive population. So you've got, this, you've got variation from the very beginnings of life in weight and growth rate. And then if we look across our wild cohorts, you see similar things here. So here you've got the males born in 2014 and the females born in 2014, the females born in 2013 and the males born in 2013. And again, you can see a similar pattern. The males, born in, uh, males and females born in 2013 have smaller variation and they're predicted to have um, larger body sizes than the individuals born in 2014, particularly the females show a lot of variation. So 2014 was a drought year, 2013 was a year um, that was pretty you know, good in terms of, of, of available productivity and water availability. So what you're, so, and then this is kind of Judy Stamp's argument, is that what you might see, what, what manifests as personality, it actually is variation in things like metabolic rate and growth rate. The animals who are growing faster may well be bolder, may well be more prone to take risks. And so that you can trace these kinds of things back to um, early infancy. You see these differences in growth rate. And then what they argue is that well, you'll find two patterns. Either individuals will start to fan out. These differences will become amplified over time. Or individuals will kind of fan in. They'll, become, they'll start off quite variable and then, and then become canalized. So again, you can look for the origins of plasticity in these kinds of um, uh, physiology, you know, looking at the, the physiological basis of plasticity in this way as well. So we're looking at this in terms of growth rate. Um, I'm giving another talk uh, tomorrow for the Marshak Colloquium, and there I'm, we're talking about some of the stuff we do on thermoregulation and uh, thermal physiology. And again, you can use that to look at physiological reaction norms and combine them with behavioural reaction norms to come up with a measure of how it is animals vary in this way. So what we think we're seeing when we look at the patterns we see in our vervets, just to, to um, cut to the chase, is that we see amplification of early differences. And that's why you're seeing this variation in things like participation rates and um, you know, the other things I haven't had time to show you, is because they are, um, individuals are fanning out and these early life differences make a big difference and they become increasingly different as they get older. And now the challenge is to see, does, well, does this have um, any fitness consequences for these individuals? So this is what I would try to, um, what I'm trying to get across here to, in conclusion to say that I really think that for primatologists in particular, this behavioral reaction norm approach is excellent because not only because it, it actually also helps align us with other people in behavioral ecology where often primatology and behavioural ecology are seen to be two different things and they don't often intersect. This idea of behavioural reaction norms really allows us a means to do that. Um, it avoids the social brain circularity because we're not sort of assuming complexity because it has to be complex because they have big brains and life seems complex. We're actually trying to measure what makes life complicated because if you have individuals who in different cohorts show different levels of plasticity and vary in their personality, how you deal with that individual has to be a much more complex 
decision-making process than if everybody has similar personalities and doesn't show variation, that much variation in plasticity. And if they're not at all, if everyone is very predictable, whereas if you have and can show uh, unpredictability, then that's another level of, of you know, um, uh, another sort of demand that's made on you when you're dealing with other animals. So I think it helps avoid that. It's certainly less anthropocentric. It doesn't, it doesn't um, anchor everything to, to a human standard. We're looking at the animals on their own terms. And I think the most important thing is it recognises that plasticity across individuals is not a monolith. Not Even though primates are very plastic species compared to certain other organisms, plasticity varies within and uh, well between and within animals depending on on context and that's something we can really start to to probe in a in an interesting and, and hopefully comparative way once we if we have more data on these kinds of reaction norms so um, thank you very much for your attention and I'd be very happy to answer any questions Sorry. Uh, thank you for a great talk. Um, I had a couple questions. First, when you um, compared the uh, variances um, between the captive and wild populations, I was curious whether you interpreted the lack of variance in the captive population as just a ceiling effect rather than um, like developmental programming for less plasticity or something like that. I'm going to do a terrible thing here because I'm going to say, oh, you have to talk to Chris Schmidt about that because he's the one who does all the, the capture stuff. But he does have a... So I, would, I, think, I think it's probably a little bit of both. There's def, I think there is definitely a ceiling effect. But he, and I can send you it, he's just published a paper on the captive data alone. And the, the interesting thing about the experimental diet is that it's actually a, it's kind of a weight loss diet, right? It's, um, and so their mothers were on it and then these infants were on it, and you see that they're predicted to actually be bigger than the ones on the standard diet, and it's because he, he thinks they've just helped generate like an obesogenic environment. So there clearly is some element of developmental programming in there as well. Yeah. But his paper is very good, and I can give you a copy of it if you'd like to look. Yes? So I thought this was really interesting, and forgive my ignorance, I'm a lowly sociologist, but um, I, I, I I wonder if so we actually have a parallel discussion in, in cultural uh, sociology thinking about embodiment and trying to sort of move beyond kind of Cartesian understanding of culture and these sorts of things. But one of the critiques is that that moves in this very Skinnerian direction. That, uh, is that a criticism though? I love Skinner. Well, He's this maligned. Might, this might be, but this might be the difference between, uh, between anthropologists and sociologists. So, so I wonder is certainly within, within sociology of obviously just, just humans, um, people want to know, like, well, what happens inside, right? What's happens in, and, and for you, is that just a black box? Is that just not something that we're going to get to, or is that something we're too focused on elsewhere? No, it, no. So this is why I think everyone should read Skinner, because Skinner talked about physiology and said we need to understand, you know, one day the physiologist will tell us what's going on inside, and right. then we'll be able to... and. We will understand it not as these kind of fictional mediators of behavior, but as part of behavior itself. And his argument was like, well, when you get to that kind of physiologic understanding, when you know what's going on inside the individual, well, don't you want to know why, why that particular thing goes on inside the individual? And Skinner's answer was, well, that's going to be found in, in its history of interactions with the environment, both ontogenetically and also phylogenetically. So his thing was like, that's as a, as a scientist of behavior, that's what I'm going to look at. And I'm going to leave the, this bit, the, what's happening inside the organism, to the people who are best suited to do it, neural physiologists, you know, are those kinds of, and then one day we'll have it all and we'll be able to understand it all together. So I think it's kind of wrong to say, you know, people get Skinner very wrong. Mm. And that's where a lot of these arguments come from that don't even really need to, to be there mm -hmm. if you actually went away and read what he, he actually said. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a, that's a kind of, that's why I would uh, how I'd answer that. I would just say, be, be pro Skinner, okay. be militant. <laughs> yeah, don't let them. Yeah, don't let them grind you down. <laughs> there was somebody up the back. I thought. Did you? Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I I'm not sure. Maybe this is sort of related to this last question about trying to understand 
what are the sources of the plasticity that you observe and whether and how trying to interpret how meaningful that plasticity really is because I can imagine certain situations where some individuals are more, have like more at stake um, at certain times like maybe they are um, you know a, a, they're some kind of uh, interaction is over a mate or over a territory and they have a lot more to gain by interacting um, or they maybe had some prior experience that shaped their future participation levels. And so I'm wondering, are you trying to tease apart on these like really detailed individual levels to make sense of this plasticity and, and how does that fit into this bigger picture of, of trying to quantify that? So that's an excellent, excellent point. And I think you know, those, those are the things that we'd really love to do, but I think some of them you can't necessarily do with wild primates. You're going to need more control, and I think you will maybe need to do something, you know. So someone like Dave Westney, who does these really lovely studies on birds, you know, and he's even now getting into the unpredictability stuff, and you can do it, you know, because he's, he's able to control things much more effectively than you can when you study wild primates. So I, don't, I would love to be able to do that, but I don't think it's necessarily possible. In, you know, uh, but maybe with lots of different people doing it and looking at captive stuff as well, you know, you can triangulate on these things. But I think you're absolutely right that that sometimes, and I mean, I really think that context matters. You know, you you really need to look at look at context. It's like you know because sometimes it will be that this mat. You know, these. So then the question becomes, when you have these. Uh, you know, like you were saying, it really, you know, you're going to try that much harder because it really matters, right? You know, is there a lot, is there an element of true unpredictability in that? Is it just being lucky, right? Or as opposed to, you know, because the other thing I like about this idea as well, what it brings in unpredictability is, is a lot of uh, evolutionary thinking, it always seems so like neat and tidy. Do you know what I mean? Everything seems like really neat and tidy. And then, but then I think, oh, it's actually, much, the world is much messier than that. And a lot of, you know, evolution adaptation, you know, like that is that nerve in the giraffe's neck that sort of, you know, only has to go this far, but it kind of goes down here and up here again. It goes all the way up its neck. And, and you know, it's like, good Lord, you know, you wouldn't design an animal like that. And I think, you know, are we looking at some things where you can kind of get this idea of, of the kind of slight randomness, the lucky chances that happen, as well as the kind of these, these particular selective processes, however, however you want to, to think about those. So I think, it, I think it's a... I think it's quite a genuinely evolutionary way of, of looking at this, but I'm not sure we'll get to that level of, of detail, which will be sad, but I'll have to live with it. So, but that's a great question. Joe. Thanks, uh, a wonderful talk. I, uh, I wonder if the, um, the behavioral reaction norm approach, which you present as an alternative to the work based on the social brain model, if they are really necessarily alternatives. That is, one could have a behavioral reaction norm approach to understanding animals attributing mental states to others. Um, and certainly we know in humans, uh, so we do a lot of mental state attribution, but, but, but people vary in how well they do that, and, and they could also very well vary in the, the slopes, that is, how much, they're, the, how much that they do that changes in response to some environmental circumstance. So I don't... Oh, I agree with you. No, I agree with you completely. I, was, I just think that, that then, you'd, but then you would be actually measuring the plasticity that, and the, the stuff that, the, that... I mean, I like that idea very much because I, the thing I'm kind of also objecting to is the idea that plasticity is a sort of monolithic trait that all individuals have as much as every other individual, right? And your idea is perfect because it would be so, well, even, you know, there would be the vari would there be variability in that? Is there do individuals show plasticity and where does it come from? Right? And I think that is slightly a slightly different question than presenting tasks to show that, you know, do primates outcompete are the pri are our dolphins as clever as apes? And are our magpies as clever as apes, as clever as dolphins? Do you know what I mean? I think it's I think it, it then helps you get away from those anthropocentric kinds of questions that you're asking. That you're not necessarily anchoring it to a. I mean, it depends on the test you use. I think it's still you still run the danger of, of thinking of theory of mind in a particular way. And then just then, then I think you are bringing in those kinds of quite anthropocentric views into it. I don't necessarily think that the scientific theory of mind mind that we have is necessarily the only way to think about mindedness. 
there could be different, you know, and I think that's part of the problem, that we have, we've got stuck, like I said, we've, we've got stuck on this one particular view of, of what the mind is and thinking of things in terms of theory of mind. And again, that's not, you don't have to think of it like that. Just because, um, just because you can show, you know, a chimpanzee doesn't seem to be attributing mental states or a, or a capuchin doesn't seem to be attributing mental states, I don't think that means that animal isn't minded. I think we're just wrong about what minds are. So, in that sense, it is a kind of alternative. Yes. Sorry. I'm sorry. Oh no, sorry. I was. <laughs> Clark. Clark had his hand up marginally okay. faster. Thank you. Um, I, just, I wanted to press you a little bit on the circularity thing, because it seems to me that um, I mean that there's a difference between a problem and a sort of an epistemological problem of circularity for science. And then what the actual explanation of something might be. The Gigerenzer quote was really pointing an explanation, and it seems to me that's where he has it wrong, because many people have suggested that the social brain, a version of the social brain hypothesis would be that there is a kind of evolutionary autocatalytic or runaway process whereby in certain lineages some groups get more complex, that selects for greater social cognition abilities, and those feedback against each other. Uh, on each other in a positive way, right? And I, I personally think that's a plausible explanation for why humans have become so um, socially complex and cognitively complex. But if that's true, then it's not circular that the complexity is part of the explanation for social cognition, right? Uh, which seems to be what Gageringer is denying in that quote. So it seems like the circularity kind of poses, a, to me, it seems like the circularity poses a problem for us as scientists, right? It's hard to test the hypothesis if... I agree. No, I absolutely ag agree with that, right? Okay. I think that is, that is part of the problem, but it's the, the failure to see that problem and assume that it's all very easy and, and, and it all works out very well. Because I think, it, because we are going, going, we've got... You know, so I think that the, there's this thing of saying, oh, well, we've got big brains, we've got sociality, and how come, and, and they, how will we we'll link these two together? And I think we do end up sometimes going a little bit backwards, and I'm, I'm certainly guilty of that in my earlier career. I'm certainly guilty of, of doing that, because, because what you're trying to explain is a lot of, you know, and then, but I think the other thing is, like, what we're trying to explain is a lot of neural tissue, and the cognitive structures that are supposed to, you know, uh, that's never, they're, ne they're never very clearly made either. So, you know, a big, a, a good pattern, record, like Fodor says, you can have one rule to learn how to play, you know, tic-tac-toe, and it would be very simple. But if you wanted to do is use a lookup table, that would take much more, you know, that takes more instantiation. So you'd end up with a bigger neural net for a simpler mechanism than for a more complex one. So I think we're, you know, so there's, there's those things. But I think that there is a sense in which when you hear and read some of the stuff, it's like, well... Groups are complex because the animals in them are complex. So they see all these things going on. They, re they, they understand the nature of the relationship between these individuals and therefore they are able to infer that other individuals would do this. And that's like, well, you're kind of putting a lot in there to start with and then, and then getting the ratchet going. It's like, where, how does the ratchet get going in the first place? And I think if you, I mean, then going all the way back to Nick Humphrey is is kind of good because he's like oh well you have different generations all living together and different you know and, and he sort of says like it's a sort of mix of individuals that that is important not what those individuals themselves kind of bring to the party cognitively and I think that is like so if that's what you're getting at as well I think that's I think that is the right way to, to go about it and there's certainly people who are working in um, so Serge Pellis who works on mm. rats has done nice stuff on on how varying the number and type of partners influences different aspects of brain growth and dendritic arborization in, in, in rat brains. And, and you know, the, if you have both adults and juveniles and you have variation in the number of partners, you get much more um, growth in the orbital frontal cortex and the prefrontal cortex than you do if you deprive animals of that. So it's kind of working out what it means to be socially complex in that kind of brain-based way as well. It's also really promising, I think. But I do think you're right. I think it is a thing of a problem for us as scientists, not a problem of ontology, so to speak. Dan, and then this late, there's a lady behind you. So, um, you presented a lot here, Louise, and it, it's, for my mind, fairly dense, so forgive me if I've misunderstood you. And, and in addition, I want to focus on one thing that you said almost incidentally toward the end of the talk, and so it may be unfair to focus on that. So correct me if I've got it wrong, but I understood you to say um, that 
the, the developmental reaction norms with regard to some gross aspect of physiology like body weight um, uh, may be correlated with the reaction norms in some aspect of behavior later in life. Um, and then you, in regard to other comments during the discussion, you seem to say, well, um, questions of function are difficult to uh, explore in free-ranging animals. But it seems to me um, there, there are only two possibilities for explaining the correlation that you postulated between the developmental reaction norms and the subsequent behavioral reaction, the plasticity in those across individuals as well as the intercepts. And that's either the, the developmental considerations are constrained, um, or there is an adaptive response to early experience. Right? And it should be possible to tease out those differences with regard to ultimate consequences for fitness. Because um, if uh, it's simply a constraint, then um, the subsequent phenotype will be less optimal than if there is an adaptive response. And moreover, the all of the individual variation that is the, the meat of your studies is grist for that analysis where um, uh, if individuals are successfully responding, as it were, to developmental circumstances, and there are other individuals who are less successfully responding to the same, you know, birth weight or, you know, weight at age one or whatever it is, right? um, then you should, over generational time, see fitness consequences. In, in, in terms of variation there as well. Yeah. Did I, I understand you correctly? Yeah, I think, but then, then the, kind of to get to the real detail of what you're talking about, the problem then is sample size. Because sometimes all that, so, you know, because sometimes, I mean, and that's part of it as well, because some, but sometimes all the, all the infants in a cohort die. Or some, or, you know, and then some of those, you know, and it's a predator comes in. So maybe that is something itself, you know, maybe you weren't, you, you know, you, Maybe that itself, your vulnerability to prejudice, could also be traced back to that. But then you can't study it because you don't have them there anymore, right? So I think part of the problem of teasing out the things that, in the way that you, which would be, which is exactly, I think you have exactly right. The the practical problem with with wild primates is that we just, you know, there's so many, you're so vulnerable to all these vagaries of, that you don't necessarily get the sample sizes needed to do it. And then other contextual things are also happening that you have no control over. So we have these three groups, and things are happening in these other two groups. And then for so in terms of this participation in in, uh, in intergroup encounters, what we what we also know we've done these uh, constructed these networks, and what we found is that certain individuals participate together more than you'd expect by chance. But they only do so when certain individuals in the other group are also participating together. So now you have to understand, to understand participation. We actually have to look at what el like exactly what's going on in the in the other group. So if the other group changes, and you know, so you can't even you have to look at the across all three groups and even probably beyond that to get some of the things you're talking about because those contextual variables will also matter to what's going on in that individual. And I think then it does become an issue of sample sizes of being able to have enough replicates to b to get at something meaningful and not just then pick up know that you're getting signal, not just noise. Um, if I could just follow up on that, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic to that problem, and I, I greatly admire the emphasis on um, purely naturalistic observation, but don't things like playback experiments offer a middle ground where you can potentially control the circumstances of elicitation and measure response, and you can have constant stimuli across seasons that vary in food availability, right, um, across um, developmental ages across individuals and so on. I mean, it yeah, doesn't seem but to me that it's an completely intractable well, problem. Well, no, no. I mean, it depends how you, in, what you're going, how you set them up and what you interpret playback experiments to show. Um, so, and, they, and, and playback experiments aren't suitable for all behaviours. So within, I mean, and we have done, we have done some of those things as well. We, we replicated the original Cheney and Seyfarth um, mm. uh, alarm call behavior and we don't we don't find anything at all like they find we don't find that um, animals respond in that classic way at all and we think it's something to do in aggregate we've got larger group sizes so the optimal response isn't to behave in those kind of archetypical ways it's to look around for more information and see if you really need to to move but again what we did find is that we also looked at their animal startle responses 
and you can show variation in their tendency to, to startle. And that seems to me a promising way that you could start looking at some of those, those ideas that you're suggesting as well. So I think, yeah, absolutely. There are certain kinds of control that you can bring in. But in terms of looking at something like whether, you know, I like just read bird, you know, studies on birds and you do, you know, these cross fostering and you can vary, you know, all these things and look at their metabolic rates and, you know, really get at the, the detail of it. I don't think that's something that's easy to do with, with wild primates. I'm just, I'm just working on the wrong animals, clearly. But, <laughs> but these are the things we want to know about primates, you know what I mean? And it, like you say, you can't just throw your, I mean, you've, caught me out beautifully. You can't just throw your hands up and say, oh, it's all very hard. You know, if you really mean it, you should actually get in there and try and do it. So I will, I'll try and do better now, Dan. <laughs> I'll try and be a better person and a better scientist. <laughs> there was, yeah. Hi, uh, thank you so much for, for the interesting talk. So I want to ask you again about the social brain hypothesis and more specifically about the study of social relationships and findings. Um, so I think one of the main assumptions um, of social brain hypothesis is that primates are actually um, cognitively capable of tracking these relationships and investing in them. And um, you, you, you look at primate social relationships in many ways. So what kinds of patterns in the data would convince you that they're actually capable of um, making these relationships? So, I mean, there's, there's like, I would break, break that apart. I would say that it's a kind of like my answer to Joe. I would say that, that what animals are doing when they're tracking the relationships, they may well be able to do that, but the way those often be are interpreted, they're interpreted in highly representational terms and of how, you know, that, that I don't necessarily think are warranted by the available data because they're open to many other kinds of interpretation. Right? It, doesn't, it kind of doesn't exclude other possible interpretations. It's consistent with it, and I don't think necessarily... If you want to say, what would it take me to convince me of a, a, that kind of heavily representational view? I, I don't think, I'm not sure anything will, because I've yet to see any human related stuff that convinces me <laughs> of, of certain kinds of representational ways of approaching things. I think we are representational animals. I'm not denying that. We, you know, we, you're, all, you're all reading things off here. You couldn't do that. But I think, I think that's when. This, this logomorphic thing comes in that we take this particular view of cognition that we have, which comes from you know, the, the, the cognitive revolution, that is itself set up in ways that were um, reflective of our cognition to start with. And we've now taken that as though it's a species-neutral theory of cognition, these representational theories of mind. We treat them as though they're species-neutral, and I don't think they are. And so my worry is really one of... We might be making an error about some of our own capacities if we articulate it in those terms. And we will then be doubling our error if we then take that particular view of, of, of cognition that we have of, the, of humans, which isn't necessarily fully accurate, and we apply it to non-linguistic animals. And then it all seems to work very nicely because we're using it in an evolutionary context and say, well, these things didn't just like spring out of nowhere. You know, they didn't just spring like, you know, Athena from the head of Zeus. They have to have some precursors. They have to have some evolutionary history. And so it all seems to make, you know, it makes, it makes sense and it all works. But I think it might have the evolutionary continuity backwards because we're starting with a very human-centric, human-developed view of cognition. And then we're applying it back but down through evolutionary time rather than starting at the, at the bottom, so to speak, and building up from there. So that's that's the issue I have. It's not so much of being convinced. It's a, it's a, it's a sort of, what is our, what is the philosophy of nature that you hold, I suppose. So I don't know if that. Yes. Hi. Uh, first off, thank you. Really interesting stuff. Um, I was curious about <coughs> the extent to which you, or the extent to which you know the social brain hypothesis is committed to a representational theory of mind as opposed to, you know, having been built on some of these more implicit measures. So you've got, you know, Onishi and Byers down in 2005, and then, you know, Kruppinia, which came out like two years ago, which showed that when you use these alinguistic measures for, you know, measuring the ability to pass false belief, you can get, you know, children as young as 13 months, and you can get non-human primates to exhibit similar patterns. And so, you know, I, I, I see the argument, but I, I guess I'm just curious as to, you know, whether or not 
you think that is communicating something about being able to track others' mental states without needing this explicit sort of, you know, mobilizable cognitive representation. And if that's the case, then do you think that this still poses the same sort of problem? So this comes back again to this idea about what is mindedness, right? Because I think if you're, when you're talking and when you read a lot of theory of mind stuff, even when it's using non-linguistic tasks, the underlying assumption is that, that there is a mental state which is somehow a representation of the other, indiv other individual. Other, so, so someone like Povanelli, for example, right? He, does, he doesn't have any truck with you know, the ability animals have no capacity to represent the mental states of other animals. And he says they only have representations of their behavior, right? So that's not about mental states at all, but it's about representations. He's, and and it's, it's because there's this, I think, this deep-seated assumption that unless you have something sitting behind behavior to, to give it meaning, then behavior is just like Jerry Fodor said, behavior is just like thrashing about. It's the cognition that gives behavior meaning. If you change and have, a, have a, an inactivist or a, a, a Wittgensteinian view of what mindedness is, it's something that, you know, then you don't have to infer mindedness because, you know, if you read someone like Peter Hacker who interprets Wittgenstein very well, he says you don't need to, you, you, you know, mindedness is inherent in the animate body. You can see mindedness. So I'll give you an example, maybe this could speak to your, your question as well. The thing that I object to in, in theory of mind type tests it's not the theory of minded bit of it. It's the alternative. So there's one study, for example, um, by uh, people at the Max Planck, I think it's like David Butterman or someone like that, and they have this experiment where they say, like, can the chimpanzee infer another, ch an another individual's goals when they change? So they have this thing where the, there's someone who's sitting, um, feeding a chimpanzee pieces of fruit, and then they get up and they walk over to another um, feeding station and they give the animal pieces of fruit and the, and the chimpanzees learn this and then there's this uh, there are these interventions put in to change the experimenter's goal and it's like will the chimpanzee infer that this has happened so one of them is somebody calls from outside and asks for a, a, a clipboard and then the person turns up and you know they chuck a clipboard on the floor and then the person gets up and instead of going to feed the chimpanzee her goal is now to pick up you know she'll pick up the clipboard Someone shouts in from outside and says the phone is ringing or something, they'll get up and they'll, they'll leave the room. So they have all these different goals and then they look at, will the chimpanzee hesitate and not move as fast to the, to the second feeding station because they'll realise that when the experimenter gets up and moves across the room, they're not necessarily going to feed them anymore. And then the, the, the way the, they do this is that the experimenter sits down, the thing happens, like an... Um, a uh, clipboard is thrown onto the ground from outside and, you know, she's, and then the person gets up, they turn around for exact number of seconds, they walk to this line which is called the criterion line, they pause and then that's when they measure what the chimpanzee, do, chimpanzee does. So, and then they say, well, the chimpanzees hesitate for two seconds longer under those conditions. And then they have a control condition where the, ex the experimenter herself sits there with a clipboard and then she picks it up and throws it on the ground and then you don't see this difference in the chimpanzee's behavior and the argument is well the chimpanzee can't be responding just to the discriminative stimulus of, of clipboard on the ground because otherwise you know because because we saw this difference and and my objection there is that somehow an animal who doesn't have the capacity to to represent the mental states of others nevertheless sees no difference between someone throwing a clipboard in from outside and a some, this person throwing their own clipboard on the floor, as though the only thing that the chimpanzee will attend to is the cl is clipboard on the floor. That, to me, is the problem with these experiments, that it's the alternative behaviourist behaviorist alternative that sees the animal as a completely mindless or to, you know, creature. And therefore, when the animal... And then so you've got this kind of mindless control and this minded alternative and so when you get this difference it's like you, you, you can just say you can just put all of the mindedness in that but I would say an animal who doesn't know how to represent mental states will nevertheless see a rich and varied temporal sequence of events and will absolutely understand a difference between someone throwing their own clipboard on the ground and someone throwing a clipboard in from from outside and that difference is a kind of mindedness 
And it's just this scientific theory of mind, the way in which it gets tested, that, we've, that that's the problem. So everyone always says that, you know, oh, you know, you don't like this, and you don't like that, you don't believe it. And I, I, I actually think animals are minded. I just don't think they're minded in that way. And I, 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 the design of these experiments is not the fact that the, of the, the test for theory of mind. It's the way in which you're, you treat an animal who doesn't have a highly representational theory of mind as though it has no mind at all, which is a caricature of the behaviorist position. <laughs> yes. So um, I'm, I'm struggling to connect the first half of the talk and the second half of the talk, and, and um, the things that you said now motivate me to struggle even more. So, the, if I understood you correctly, the the unpredictability, the reaction norm component that you're seeing, um, you suggest is pushing in the direction of representations of behavior and not representations of motives. No, I'm not talking about I'm not talking about representations at all. I mean that my, my what I'm trying to say and what I'm trying to do is that I mean and this is where like I you know my objection to, to some of the to the playback idea kind of comes in is a lot of tests are let's control for everything and then let's let's kind of test for an animal's capacities by just asking it to like you know respond to a speaker, or you know now there's a thing of like putting dogs in fMRI machines to show that they have you know do they have the same emotions as people, and it's like it's the thing about those is that you're kind of again you're taking away all the actual stuff that's going on to kind of make it into this clean test of of, of one thing or another, and my view is. It's not so much are we, you know, do they have representational minds or do they? Not? It's like we don't even know the scope and limits of their plasticity and what they're actually capable of behaviorally. So we need to know much more about that before we get to the question of exactly how, you know, what's going on on the inside. That's what I'm trying to say. If there's any connection between the two halves of my talk, which there may not be, as I said, um, that, that I think it's that, that we need to understand more about the flexibility of behavior and the, the scope and limits of that kind of plasticity and use that to then try and inform the sorts of mindedness that we exp or, or you know cognition that we see in these animals and come to it without necessarily leaping towards these kind of representational theories that we have developed in in and for humans so i think that's what i'm getting at. So, so i don't have any objection to the the, the data-driven empiricist theory development enterprise and more power to you on that where where, where i struggle it's not it's not it's not just in it's not it's not sort of Dust boy empiricism, though, is informed by a different theory. It's informed by these theories that come from an inactivist embodied, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of theory out there that can inform this kind of stuff. It's not simply measuring it without any theory of mind. Uh, I understand, but in, in, in measuring reaction norms and unpredictability, you're, I mean, the, 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 as I understand, the implicit connection between the two halves of the talk then is to show. See, it's really complicated, right? And so, a, a simple um, mentalistic representation system won't work. But I mean, another quote that you could add to your list of eminent thinkers would be, um, you know, the former U.S. Secretary of Defense in terms of his um, unknown unknowns and unknowns. <laughs> right? that, that, um, you know, there's there are individuals who are predictably unpredictable in some circumstances, and there are individuals who are unpredictably unpredictable, and then that, of course, is recursive, right? Yeah, but that, I mean, and I would say at the moment, like in terms of a lot of what you read in primatology and like primatological studies of this, we don't really, we don't, we don't characterize that complexity. We haven't characterized the the extent and of that plasticity. That's what I'm trying to get at. We need. Because then when we understand better what exactly is, seems to, what does seem to be complicated, because, you know, coalitions don't occur as often as you think, right? They, I don't really think they can work as a, that kind of organizing principle that would, that would have that effect. They're, they're, very, they're actually very rare. Not everyone, um, our baboons don't form coalitions at all, neither the males nor the females. Um, so, and it's not as widespread as you imagine. So it's like there are these little things where we've kind of clung onto them that you know, oh, coalitions—they would, you know, they're political. They would need a lot of it, and then you've 
without documenting how widespread it is, whether they really could work as an evolutionary organizing principle of that kind, that's what I'm trying to get at. We need to, we need to actually, it's a bit Tim Bergian, like, you know, you need to kind of, you know, he always said about psychology, it, it left out the natural history phase and went straight to the experimental phase. And sometimes I think that, that the study of cognition in this way, we started off well with sort of cognitive ethology, you know, and Griffin and all this kind of thing of like, let's bring these things back into it. But then we went straight to being quite experimental and without saying that, well, eth you know, ethology can tell us a lot of these things by actually looking at the measuring the behavior under natural circumstances and documenting where these complexities actually do seem to lie and then using that to, to generate the, the kinds of tests that would tell us potentially the kind if you are and I'm saying if you're you know if you want to do it and be a cognitive psychologist and say you know these are the kinds of um, use behavior as a means to as a kind of window onto the mind and say these would be the kinds of inferences an animal would have to make then then you know that's also you can do that but I I also think there's room for an alternative non-representational um, view as well but again I think you can if we have a better grounding in the natural history then we can generate good hypotheses that would allow us to test between those alternatives. That's, that's more, more of everything, I think, is what I'm saying. More stuff. Well, um, we'll have more of this, but we're already four minutes over, so we'll be there. Thank you.